Okay, so first off, thank you everyone for joining the workshop from lots of different places. So a lot of you guys, it sounds like you're already pretty sleepy. So hopefully you guys can make it through this. And as you mentioned, if not, there's a recording of it. So you guys can check it out later. Um, so thank you to everybody who's here and thank you to Tokyo Developer Study Weekend for having me. You guys are awesome. Um, so welcome to the workshop. Uh, those of you that aren't familiar with my work, I'll just show a quick bit about it. And uh, they posted my website if you guys want to check out a little bit of what I do. Um, so very, very briefly, um, I work independently as a audiovisual uh, creator and I create interactive performances. So I do a whole range of things, but pretty much everything revolves around my interest in sound and around visualizing sound. And so um, Growing up, I've always visualized sound in my head. Um, I have a, a type of synesthesia, and so, so I've always been a strong connection with uh, visual and audio. And uh, once I started getting into generative design, then pretty much that was my interest in finding ways to express sound visually in many different ways through the softwares that I was learning. Um, so currently I use software, uh, touch designer for a lot of stuff, and we're gonna dive into that a little bit later on. Um, but throughout leading up to touch design, I've worked with processing uh, Max MSP and a lot of other software. So today's workshop is actually going to uh, be a, a mix of creative and technical. So we are gonna get a full mix of things. So we're not gonna do just technical with touch designer. We're actually gonna be doing a lot of the creative end and uh, talking about what is sound and diving into different aspects of sound and how to work with sound creatively. Um, and then of course, going into also the technical side of sound and how to analyze it properly and pull out different characteristics that you can then map to visual um, properties. So uh, visual parameters. So we're gonna be talking about both sides of it. Um, the workshop is basically set up in three different parts and between each part, we're gonna take a break. So the first part is all about exploring sound uh, and several different methods of uh, visualizing sound, but it's going to be not in touch designer yet. So this is completely outside of uh, software specific, but we're gonna be looking at sound from a lot of different angles. And what this is is basically taking a lot of different ways that I've explored sound in the past and things I've learned about sound and kind of putting it all together. If I had a wish list of things that I wish that I had known all in one packaged one hour presentation before I went into visualizing sound and kind of just the variety of different ways that, that you can work with sound. Then this is me packaging that up and sharing it with you guys and some examples of, of things that I've done along the way to explore sound in different ways. Uh, part two is going to be jumping into touch designer and looking at different audio sources, uh, working in with different audio analysis techniques, and learning how to isolate audio features that you can then map to visual parameters. And then we'll take a break. And part three is going to be uh, creating an autoreactive scene that responds to interactive control, and really thinking about the sound um, characteristics and getting very creative with the nuances of sound. So not just the technical aspects of how to map things together, but really thinking about the mood of, of the sound and how to embody sound in different ways so that it really enhances the experience of the audio itself. Okay. Um, so now we're going to get into talking about sound um, really quick. If you guys have any questions or if I start talking too fast or uh, there's anything that you wanted to bring to my attention, uh, as mentioned in the beginning, there is a Q&A section, section. So if you post anything there, I do have it open over here so I can check it and I'll try and keep an eye on that. So if you guys do have a question, please feel free to post it there. Uh, and if you guys just have a general comment, then you can, oh, thank you. Glad you like the website. If you have a general comment, then you can also post it just in the, the general chat. Uh, so uh, what we're gonna be talking today is, so we have sound and we're gonna be talking about how to visualize it. But the thing that we're really focusing on today and the name of the workshop is methods of visualizing sound. So the thing that we're focusing on is this black box here, which really in some ways is the hardest aspect because the visuals at the end, we have that sound kind of comes in as the thing that's driving it. But the way that we interpret sound can be done in many different ways. So that's what we're talking about today is methods of visualizing sound. Okay. So basically there's several different ways that you can do it, but pretty much any way that you approach it it's going to be one of these four categories that we're going to talk about. So no matter what you do, it might be combination of these, but it's going to fall into one of these four categories. 
So the first one that we're going to look at more in detail after this is uh, the physical sound vibrations. So how to use sound vibrations as the driving force that is driving the visuals that are creating the sound and how to explore how to represent the sound using sound vibrations and also air pressure. Next category is analog or electrical signal. So we're going to take a look at some examples, uh, not super in depth, but just some examples of how you can use control voltage uh, and oscilloscopes and things like that. Next is data or digitize, which for a majority of what we're doing is going to be in this category. So this is, of course, once we go into touch designer, working with sound, once it's digitized, anything that we're doing in some kind of computer software is going to be this data uh, digitized portion. And finally, creative. So this is uh, almost anything that's not the others. And of course, with creative, that's going to overflow into these categories. But the creative uh, category is pretty much anything that is story driven or something uh, more experimental or even a synesthetic representation. So basically, this one is where you're thinking creatively about sound. And let's say that you're creating a music video, but it's based purely on ideas that you have in your head, but it's not driven by data. So, so the data is, as we'll see in a moment, basically directly feeding uh, information from the analyzed sound into the visuals. The creative category is thinking about story, thinking about experimental aspects, aspects but it's not driven by data. Uh, so the first one is visualizing physical properties of sound. And Hopefully you guys are all interested in sound because if you're at this workshop, that's kind of an assumption that I'm going to make. So those of you guys in the chat, if anybody hates sound, then you might not want to sit through the rest of this because this whole section is about sound. Um, so first we're going to talk about the physical properties, how sound actually works. And this is going to directly feed into talking about how to visualize the physical properties of it. Uh, so sound is a pressure wave. So this is an illustration of how sound travels through, through the air. So basically when you have air molecules and you have sound, then it's going to, it's called compression and rarefaction, which I, I might be pronouncing wrong, but it basically the air molecules, they expand or they, uh, they move away from each other and they come back together. So basically you have this pressure wave and that's how sound travels through the air. So if we were to represent this as a waveform, I'm sure you guys have all seen this before, um, there's a lot of overlapping connections between when we see waveform representations of things and that directly correlates to things like air pressure. So when we have the, we're going to represent it as, this is a, a pure sine wave. So um, a lot of information in sound is going to be much more complex than this. This is a very simple sine wave. So this is basically like a perfect plus one to minus one. And then where we have zero means no change. So if we were to represent that compression, compression and rarefaction as a sine wave, this is what we get is this oscillating sine wave. So again, this is a perfect sine wave rep representation of it. This is a complex sound, but we have the representation of the pressure and then the um, reduced pressure, which is going to be negative one, and then zero, which is our node, is no change. Um, a wavelength, so when we represent things as a waveform, a wavelength is the measurement of the same position and peak to the adjacent same position and peak. So when we talk about wavelength, it's the distance from the same point of one peak going through the uh, waveform traveling back up to the same position on the adjacent waveform. Um, Hertz, so a lot of these if you come from an audio background, a lot of these you're already going to know, um, but this is kind of like the geek ch checklist So just make sure that we're all on the same page so that if there's any questions about, well, I've heard Hertz said a lot and I, I visualize sound, but I don't actually, if you ask me to define what Hertz is, I couldn't actually tell you. So a lot of these things that we're going through are kind of like the, the geeky checklist of make sure if you're visualizing sound, these are things that you should definitely have in your knowledge bank of what it is. Um, so Hertz literally means cycle, cycles per second. So whenever we're working with waveforms, it literally is basically it goes up, it goes down, and then back to the same point. That is one cycle. So if we talk about 60 cycles per second, that means 60 times per second, the, uh, the sine wave or uh, the waveform itself is going up and down. So if you think about a speaker, that means 60 times per second, that speaker is going up and down. Um, in general, so uh, actually, 
Let's see. So higher frequency is going to be a shorter wavelength. So um, I did 30 and 60. So if you think about um, if our measurement of time is a uh, second, so if we have 30 cycles per second, then it's going to be longer. Um, when you're first learning about this, it might seem counterintuitive because you have higher frequency and shorter wavelength, but it's really easy if you think about it and look at it visually, because if you have a longer wavelength, then you need less of them to travel a certain distance. So if our distance is one second, then we need less of them to take up that one second. Um, if we have 60 seconds or 60 hertz, then it's going to be uh, half as long and it's going to have a uh, higher perceived pitch. So higher frequency is a higher pitch. So now getting into, now that we've kind of talked about the background of uh, how sound works traveling through air, talking about ways that you can visualize that. So this is a Rubens tube uh, and I credited, um, this one I didn't do. A lot of the examples you'll see are from me, but this one I credited the artist that did this one. So with the Rubens tube, the way that it works is exactly like we were talking about with air pressure. So you have the compression and rarefaction. So as the sound is going through the tubes, then you have that change in air pressure, which is then affecting the flames that are coming out of the tube. So you can literally visualize the waveforms that are coming out of it. So this is, these are basically, you can see uh, pretty much perfect sine waves that come through it. So you have the the positive pressure and then the lowered pressure, which then pulls it back in. And you can literally visualize that through the, uh, the flames and the air pressure. You can also use acoustic levitation. So some of you guys might be looking at this and saying, science is really weird. How can sound levitate things? And some of you guys might be looking at this and saying, that seems like a great idea for an audio visual performance. So if you guys aren't in the second camp, hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will be thinking, yeah, that seems like a great idea for a performance. I definitely want to levitate objects with sound and I definitely want to turn that into a performance. So that's what this presentation is all about, is thinking creatively about merging science as well and all these different aspects of sound and how to approach sound in different ways to turn that into some sort of creative visualization. Cymatics, how many of you guys have, I'm, I'm looking in the chat, how many of you guys have heard of cymatics before? Hopefully some of you guys, yes, awesome, cool. Um, so I'm pretty obsessed with cymatics, um, maybe not as much as I used to be because I've kind of like branched out into other things, uh, but for several years I spent a lot of time exploring ways of visualizing sound and trying to find a balance between uh, certain aesthetics that I liked, but also trying to explore the science behind sound vibrations. So cymatics is literally studying the physical sound vibrations. And what you're seeing here is called a clotney plate. And so the way that it works is that you sprinkle sound on this, uh, in this case, it's a metal plate and the sound transfers through this uh, material. So in this case, it's metal. So different material vibrates differently. So the sound transfers through the metal. And if you remember how we had the, um, the sine wave, so you have the positive and the negative and right where it's zero, it's called a node. So that means there's no change. So you have this plate and everything is vibrating. Everything is in motion, which means that the sand is going to be moving around and is going to keep wanting to bounce around this plate. What you're seeing right here is actually the node. So that's where things are canceled out on the plate. And so the whole thing is vibrating and you have places where um, maybe you have a positive and a negative, which cancels out to zero. So that means that there's no change, no vibration on the plate. So as the sand is moving around, it wants to line up along those uh, uh, spaces where there's no vibration because then it doesn't have to bounce around. So it's gonna keep bouncing around until it hits those nodes around the plate. Um, here's some different examples. So same that you saw here, but just breaking it out into different frequencies and what they look like visually. So different frequencies because of the interactions and how they're going to affect that uh, material, then they're going to create different patterns by the way that they're interacting and canceling out. And so these are, um, there's so many studies done on this and, and you can create so many interesting things, basically exploring how they um, cancel each other out. And I've even seen with um, creating uh, violins and different instruments, they've actually vibrated the, uh, the body of the instrument to look at those patterns, to make sure that the sound will be evenly distributed and uh, will flow through the instrument perfectly. So if you wanna get a really good sound, you can use cymatics to, to look at the material, the body of the instrument and see if it's perfectly even and sand down parts that aren't. 
And it is affected, of course, by the shape of it. So this is an example of on the left, we have a circle and on the, the right, we have a square. So the containing shape that is vibrating, of course, does then affect it because it's going to vibrate in a very different way. So if you have a different shape, then that completely changes the, uh, the appearance of the sand and the patterns that it makes because it's vibrating differently. Um, so when I was interested in cymatics, these are um, some photographs that I took. So I spent a lot of time um, being interested in ways of using sound and exploring the sound as a way of, of visualizing things. And so um, these were some experiments that I did on a quest to kind of like find my aesthetic and use cymatics as a way to stay true to like creating the things that, that interested me visually, but also learn about sound at the same time. So these are a few photographs that I took. Um, during the process, and one of the reasons I want to emphasize this is because there's so many ways to, to approach sound, but also, even if it's done, been done before, if it's something that has a lot of different variables, then you can still experiment with different approaches to it. So like semiotics has been around for, I don't remember the exact year, but a very long time. But when I experimented with it, I tried uh, different light sources, a lot of, of course, different frequencies, um, different speakers, um, introducing a lot of different variables into the system to try and get a certain aesthetic that I liked. So I didn't want to just recreate um, the exact cymatics I have seen other people doing, but I really wanted to try and find my own aesthetic within those experiments. And a few more. And um, so talking about how this can be used, uh, not just for photographs and, and uh, experimenting with that stuff, but I actually did a full, um, let me do this, but turn down the sound, uh, dome performance using cymatics. And so this was, um, you know, when you're thinking about interesting ideas for exploring sound and actually turning that into a video or a performance or something that, that's a little bit more beyond just taking a picture of it or something that you post online. Um, this was actually um, a segment from a dome performance I did actually the first dome performance that I did that was 100% um, live cymatics. So um, what I did was I had the whole setup uh, in the dome and I was doing all the audio live and that I had a camera that was projecting the visuals uh, from the water. I should mention this is water, not sound, uh, sand, obviously. So this is water with a light above it. Um, and for this, I had to write the entire soundtrack, um, basically finding sounds that look good visually. So as we're talking about process and like different ways to come at it, um, there's, at least for me, there's not one set process. Um, for me, it's not find audio, analyze it, and then create the visuals. For me, a lot of times it's actually kind of the reverse too. And there's like this dynamic between the sound and the visuals. And sometimes I create the sound to drive the visuals and it, it's a very close relationship creating both of them at the same time. Um, so yeah, for this one, I, I literally wrote the audio <laughs> months and months of experimenting and trying out different sounds. And uh, while we're here, I'll just kind of fast forward a little bit so you can see um, different variations of, this one's more like a chant. Which is actually my voice that I manipulated heavily. And in a second, you'll see a higher pitch one. And then that's the two of them together. So um, actually, I really wanted to, to show this because um, with this one, we had kind of talked about introducing story into it. And so um, even though it seems like it's really abstract throughout the course of, this was a 30 minute performance, throughout the course of it, I was actually using the sounds to develop a story. And it was kind of this, um, I wouldn't say a duel, but it, it was almost like a, like a love story in a way between like the, these different sounds. And then there was, because of the way that it was set up, there was some drama that, that would come in, but it was purely using sounds and visuals to try and create this abstract story that was behind it. Um, and then this was a, a totally different performance also using cymatics for the uh, Society for Art and Technology. Um, so this one, you can see a little bit more of my setup. 
So um, with this one, I have the speaker and uh, I was using Touch Designer for this one. So leading into Touch Designer, um, I had a camera that you can see up here and then everything is projecting live. So the, the camera feed was actually going into Touch Designer um, and then everything was projected live on the dome. And for this one, um, as I mentioned, different shapes create different um, look of the cymatic. So actually 3D printed, you can see it right here. Um, that I alternated different shapes containing shapes for the cymatics. So I had like a hexagon that the um, sound was inside. So it would break up the shapes in different interesting ways on the dome. So that's um, all about physical properties of sound and um, different ways of working with cymatics and thinking about it, like not even going into the computer yet, but just thinking about the physics of sound and how you can directly translate the physical sound vibrations or um, air pressure into what you're visualizing. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about the electrical or analog properties of sound. Um, so analog in this sense literally just means it's a continuous signal. So when we get into digital, you'll see how we break up the signal into uh, specific um, samples of the audio. So with this, the analog means that it's a continuous signal. I'm sure you guys are familiar with an oscilloscope. If you're not, then you've probably seen them in movies, in laboratories, or hacker dens or something. They are always used to make something look very high tech. Um, so this is an oscilloscope. And uh, so we are talking about visualizing sound, but what this actually is doing is uh, visualizing the electrical signal. So while you will see it a lot um, in conjunction with working with sound, what it's actually doing is it's visualizing the audio signal, which um, that elect, or sorry, the um, electrical signal that same electrical signal is then also mapped to a speaker to create sound. So it's not directly representing the sound, it's directly representing the electrical signal, which can also be turned into sound. So they are linked, but it's not um, taking directly from the sound. Um, these are uh, list of Jew figures, and I apologize if I butcher any of these names. I usually read the names, but I never hear anybody actually say it. So um, if anybody speaks proper French, I know that I'm butchering it, I'm sorry. Uh, but these are, um, if you were to use the oscilloscope and you have two signals coming in, so this is a great illustration on the right. If you have two signals, um, two waveforms here. So we have a sine wave that's, uh, let's call this, I'm just estimating because this is shorter. So let's say that this, that this is uh, 30 and let's say that this is 60. So when you have the two signals coming in and you're mapping it two dimensionally. So we have the Y plane and the X plane and they're both, this signal and the signal are driving the position of this dot that's moving very quickly on the oscilloscope. So we have a, a single dot that's moving very quickly drawn on the screen. So if you're drawing it in two dimensions and you have the X and Y, which is two different signals, then the interaction between those two signals is gonna create these different patterns. Um, so purely by changing the frequency and working with two signals, you can already see how that creates these interesting, more complex figures. And if you're like me and you love math, then this is very exciting because then this is literally driven by the interaction between different numbers. So you have the, the relationship between different frequencies and that relationship can be varied in different complex ways and can create um, any number of interesting shapes. Um, Speaking of interesting shapes, uh, this is one guy that I really love his work. So he took that same idea and let's see, and he has a whole series of videos. This is gonna be really loud. Whole series of videos where he's using that same idea to um, draw with the oscilloscope. Fast forward just a little bit. So I highly recommend checking out. This is a uh, Jerobeam Fenderson or Oscilloscope Music. He does a whole series of these, um, drawing mushrooms and all sorts of complex shapes just using the oscilloscope. Um, inspired by the uh, this is you figures, these are ones that I did uh, in Touch Designer, 
working with the same idea, taking two audio signals and exploring how those two signals could interact together to create uh, different complex oscillating forms. Um, so the, the one on the left is using a sine wave and you can directly see that because it actually takes on a more circular form. Uh, the one on the right, I'm pausing you for a second if you wanna guess what kind of waveform that is. That's a square wave. I didn't know if anyone was gonna put it. So the one on the right is a square wave and you can literally see how, um, so mapping those positions using the two signals, it actually looks directly like a square because I'm using a square wave. Um, so one of the things that I love is working with um, different um, oscillations. So uh, different oscillators and basically exploring the mathematics between uh, the interactions between the two. So these ones were, were based on that. Um, and talking about control, control voltage. So uh, is anybody into modular sense? Looking at the chat. If you are, nice. Um, I wish that this one was mine. I cannot take credit for this. Uh, this is my friend, uh, Boyd Bondular, who lives a few blocks away from me and he builds all of his own modules and is amazing. So if you wanna look up Boyd Modular, he does really cool stuff. And this is a fraction of his setup. Uh, he pretty much has his entire room just wall to wall with different stuff. Um, but anyway, so with the uh, modular synth, if you're into modular synthesizers, um, you can use control voltage and um, thinking creatively about not just being limited to visualizing sound directly, but um, control voltage is used, of course, with modular sense to control any number of uh, behaviors in the different modules, um, which then, of course, directly affects the sound. So what you can do is if you're working with touch designer, um, you can use touch designer to control the modules, but that same signal that you're then sending to control the control voltage, um, using that within touch designer to then control visuals. So it's kind of a, a different way of thinking about using the same related signal to uh, create a connection between the visuals and the sound. So um, there's a lot of different ways to set it up. And of course you can work with the control voltage in different ways too. Uh, but one of the things I've done in touch designer is that basically um, sending the same signal to the modular sense that are also controlling parameters within, um, within the visuals in touch designer. Uh, this is um, this is going to be low resolution because this one is really fine line. So it's uh, there's a higher resolution version online, um, but unless it's super high resolution, then the lines end up looking like they do now. So I'll just show a quick clip. So this is basically what I just talked about of using uh, the same signal from Touch Designer that's going to the modular sense. And um, so with this one, actually what I did, um, so I did have the same signal that was controlling parameters in Touch Designer and also going to the sense, but then also um, creating more sounds with the modular sense and then sending the finished output from that into Touch Designer again to then analyze it and then drive some more of the properties. So it was kind of uh, driving it within Touch Designer to the modular sense and then the final audio then being sent back to Touch Designer analyzed and then driving some more of the, the parameters in Touch Designer. Um, and a lot of the experiments that I do, um, if you guys are into Touch Designer, I highly encourage you if you're you're trying to experiment with doing audiovisual stuff um, is to just experiment with a lot of different stuff and to try and find the, um, the connection between a certain aesthetic and, and the music. So basically like with this one, what I did again, was working with creating the audio at the same time that I was also creating the visuals. And I always try to look for creating visuals that embody the mood of the visuals. And so with this one, um, it was very, very noisy. And so I wanted something that looked very chaotic and noisy and um, encapsulated the sound of that very textural, uh, noisy um, uh, process that I was using. Ooh, that's not supposed to happen. Kind of cool, but also glitchy at the same time. And that's actually stuck on a frame. That was kind of cool. Um, so the next one that we're gonna talk about is visualizing data-driven or a digital property. So this is the majority of probably the process that you're gonna do. 
Um, so this is once you're in using literally any kind of software. So it's going to be digitized at that point once you're working with the sound on the computer end of things. Um, but I hope that looking at the all these different ways that you can work with sound that inspires you to, to bring those processes into um, if you're only working digitally now to kind of branch out and to explore different ways to, to bringing that into your current workflow. So we talked about the analog signal. So that's basically working the, with the electrical signal and analog literally just means a continuous signal. So if we look on the left, this is going to be analog. So it's one smooth uh, continuous signal. Once we bring into the computer, we have to sample it or digitize it. So when we sample things, it takes that continuous signal and we have to sample it at specific points um, to basically convert that sampled audio or that, that um, incoming sound into samples that we can work with and um, digitize them so that they can be worked with in the computer. Um, so when we do that, a couple important things to know if you're gonna be working with sound. Um, one important thing is the sample rate. So when you're sampling the audio, um, and you've probably seen this a bunch, and I'm sure a lot of you guys, if you uh, work with audio, you know what the sample rate is. So that's the rate at which the audio is sampled. And so um, a common sample rate is 44.1, which actually we'll get to in just a second. Um, the only other one that I want to tell you is the bit depth is the resolution or precision of each sample. So basically, as you're sampling audio, you have two main things. You have the sample rate, which is uh, how many times per second it's being sampled, and then the bit depth, which is how precise that sample is. So you can basically think of it um, in a very simple version. If you have a decimal point, then it's like the number of points after the decimal point to, to get that precision of the sound. So a higher bit depth is of course gonna be more precise. And uh, if you can actually hear the difference, which I know some audio files can definitely hear the difference, then uh, yeah, the depth can be very important. Um, sample rate is a uh, very common one is 44.1 thousand samples per second. And uh, some of you guys, you don't have to post in the thing, but I like to ask questions so you can kind of think to yourself before I tell you the answer. Um, so a common sample rate is 44.1. If you come from an audio background, you might know reasons why this is a good sample rate. Uh, and I'm gonna get into it in just a second. So if you don't know the immediate answer to why we use 44.1, um, it does have a history behind it. Um, actually, I don't know that one. Rob's saying major C note. Actually, um, that might be connected and I would love to hear if it is connected to C. I haven't heard that one. Um, it does have a history behind it, but one of the main reasons why they decided on 44.1 is because of the Nyquist theorem. So human hearing is, uh, the human hearing range is 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz. And so Nyquist theorem says that you should have a sample rate at least double uh, your highest frequency. So if the human hearing range goes to 20,000 Hertz, um, and so we have a, a range of music or audio that we're working with, then twice that would be 40,000. And then you just throw on an, uh, an extra 100 for, 100 for good measure. So make sure that it goes over that. Um, and the reason for that, so um, just to really quickly, very quickly explain Nyquist theorem. Um, I hope you guys in the chat are super nerds because the reason that I put this stuff in here is even if you're mainly concerned with the visual side of things, uh, we're not going to dive super deep into the math, but all of this stuff I feel is really good to know if you're visualizing sound just for the sake of knowing the relationship between like sampled audio and when you see these numbers, you know why they are the way that they are. Um, so if you think about uh, when you have a strobe light and you're looking at a fan, so let's say that the fan is turning us at a certain rate and then you have a strobe light. You guys have all seen this, right? Where the strobe light, if you get the right frequency of strobe, then the fan basically stands still, right? You guys have all seen that. So if you get to the point where it's standing still and then you do half of that, then you'll have it so that it's basically getting two different points at the same time, right? So that would be if we were sampling like uh, two times per second or twice that. So if you do higher than that, then you actually start to get more resolution and you can actually see the movement of the fan. So if you only did two times the highest frequency, then basically you would have two points where it's oscillating the exact same and you couldn't actually get of the highest one and then you couldn't actually get that density. So one of the reasons why you wanna make sure that you're past that is so that you actually get enough resolution. So when you're sampling 
for visualizing, just make sure that uh, you're careful about your sample rate if you change it, because then you're gonna lose some of that uh, detail in the audio. Oh, yes. Okay, so <laughs> I wrote a note to myself. So uh, fast Fourier transform, do I have a um, fast Fourier transform, which we're going to get into when we get into a touch designer. But um, basically what I wanted to say about this without diving too much into the math, because it is super exciting. Um, fast Fourier transform or FFT is the main method of translating uh, sound in the time domain to sound in the frequency domain. So basically this is how software, a majority of software that you're gonna be working with uh, breaks out the audio into the frequency spectrum so that you can work with and then break it out into uh, different sections of the audio spectrum that you want to work with. So you don't have to know the math behind it, unfortunately, as much as I would love to dive into a whole lecture on the math behind it. Um, but basically, FFT is a method that pretty much any audio software that you're working with uh, to analyze sound or visualize it, almost all of them are gonna be working with FFT in some way to translate the sound from an audio signal in the time domain to breaking it out into individual uh, frequencies. Um, to show an example of, um, so this was way before I started working with Touch Designer, I was working with Cinema 4D, and this is a way of, um, of basically mapping that FFT signal, which is if you think of an array of um, values, and then uh, I map that array to the individual squares. And so uh, the downside to Cinema 4D is that it's not real time. So here's a, a definite plug for why I love Touch Designer is uh, none of this was in real time. So I had to basically map everything out and then render it frame by frame. And then once it finished rendering, I got to see the final video to see if everything worked out. But um, I'll show you really quickly. So what I, this is doing, if you imagine each of these squares being a section, basically like an array of the audio, and then you can see how it behaves differently um, from the FFT. So that was uh, one of the earlier ones I did. And um, as we're getting into talking more creatively about things, um, you'll notice that a lot of my work tends to be uh, for the most part black and white. With this one, it's very pink and uh, pastel -y colors. Um, so whenever I'm visualizing sound, I always think about the mood that I wanna capture and I try and do my best to uh, embody the sound in the visuals. And so with this one, uh, that song, the song that you heard in the background, which is by, um, Go qualia, which I put somewhere on here. Um, to me, it sounded like um, at certain parts, a computer trying to like figure itself out. And so I wanted something very glitchy and disorganized. And uh, so this is what I came up with for visualizing that, that uh, audio. Um, this is drawing with sound. And so this is a very simple idea, but just again, thinking about different ways that you can work with visualizing sound. So this is mapping the, um, I'll play it in the background while I'm talking, uh, mapping the uh, RMS power, which is essentially, we'll call it the amplitude for now until we explain what RMS power is, but basically mapping the amplitude of the sound so you can draw with the sound and create different shapes. So it's an interactive, playful way of using the sound as your paintbrush, essentially. And um, I mentioned I like black and white. So for this one, I wanted it to be, um, a very obvious, uh, these black and white uh, stripes, but I've also worked with this as more um, softer shapes that basically build these kind of sound worms that you can draw with. And uh, I did that for one of the performances in the dome. So basically it's these massive like sound worms that were drawn in real time. And so they, it can be constructed if you map that to also be creating the sound at the same time, then instead of just having the sound predetermined and then you're just drawing with it, you can map it so that you're literally um, composing the sound at the same time that you're drawing with the sound. And it becomes this whole different process of turning the sound that you're creating, which is also driving the visuals that you're creating into this whole uh, process and um, this whole like different way of creating um, 
basically a work of art that's like a real time generative work of art that you're doing the sound and the visuals for. And let's see, finally, uh, visualizing sound as creative interpretation. So we talked about visualizing sound as physics, thinking about the physics of sound, uh, thinking about analog sound, thinking about digitized sound, and finally, visualizing sound as creative interpretation. So with this one, which is almost the most challenging, you are the black box. So in the beginning, we showed visuals, sound, or sound visuals, and then the black box. With the creative interpretation, you are entirely the black box. So that means that anything that, that you visualize, anything that you're trying to um, pull out of the audio and then create visually is entirely coming from your mind. So the thing that's driving the visuals is you. You don't have uh, the data driving it. You don't have anything else. It's literally just your creation. Um, so in that regard, when you do other things, you're probably going to weave story into it other way. Um, but this one creatively uh, is basically encapsulating, let's say you go out with your camera and you record uh, live, live motion people doing things, or you wanted to weave an abstract story that's not directly driven by the data. This is what that one would be. Um, and this actually does fall into that category because um, these are shapes that I um, was experimenting with in Touch Designer. And this was part of a process of both learning new techniques within Touch Designer visually and exploring different aesthetics. And at the same time, wanting to match uh, that learning process with creating sound to go with the behavior of these. So um, basically when I, when I hear sound, to me, it has personalities. And when I see shapes, the shapes have audio that goes with them. And so what I try to do is marry those two together. And so um, these, I actually created the visuals first in Touch Designer. And then uh, with the modular sense, I sat down and while I was watching these, I then wrote the music for them. And when I saw them visually, to me, they were um, very chaotic and like they were trying to come into their own, trying to take some kind of form, but they were uh, in the form of like metamorphosis. So these are both called uh, metaphor metamorphosis part one and two. Um, so this is the part one, and then this is kind of more its final form as it's becoming a bit more chaotic, but this is closer to its final chaos form in a bit. Hopefully, there we go, Let me stop that one. So as we're talking about how, um, I guess I can play it in the background while I'm talking about, um, we're going to dive really deep into thinking about the characteristics of sound and how to translate certain characteristics and certain moods of sound into visuals. Um, so with this one, you can see it's more chaotic. It's also the music in the background is much higher pitch and tense and it, it holds this, um, uh, this note that to me, um, sometimes it's hard to describe what I saw in my head, um, was the, the apex of the transformation as opposed to this one being more, um, was like the strumming, which was more playful, like it was just beginning the transformation. Um, so some of me describing this may sound, I don't know, maybe weird, but as we start to get into actually thinking about what are the characteristics of, of sound creatively and not just technically, then thinking about those aspects of how do you create tension, how do you represent tension visually and, and the balance between those two and how to uh, join those two audio and visual together to enhance the experience of uh, how people perceive the sound. And oops, sorry, I meant to go to the next one. Um, so now we're going to talk about synesthesia. And how many of you guys in the chat, actually let's ask how many of you guys have, have synesthesia? Anybody? There's, well, I'm waiting to see if one, <laughs> one person has synesthesia. Somebody just responded once. So I'm guessing that means yes. One for yes. Technically, digitally, one would mean yes. So awesome. Um, nice. Uh, and some of you guys might even have it and not realize that you have it. And I'm actually not surprised by the number of people that have it because, oh, nice. Hi, Riley. <laughs> um, I'm not surprised by the number of people have it because those that do have it tend to express it in different creative ways. So a lot of people in the creative uh, fields 
do have synesthesia. And there's actually, a lot of people don't realize there are a number of different types of synesthesia. Um, if you've never heard of synesthesia, basically it's the crossing of different senses. And so um, there's a lot of different types. We're gonna focus mainly on ones that are related to sound and visuals. Uh, but as you can see, uh, there's, if you look across the top and the bottom, there's all these different mappings. So for example, um, that being music note with uh, connects or Lexeme or that one's blacked out because it's the same thing, uh, odors. So there's all these different kinds of basically where different senses get intertwined in your mind where you experience one sensation as provoked by another sensation. So we'll look at one example that's directly related to what we're talking about. Uh, so chromesthesia is seeing music in colors. So people with chromesthesia, which was probably, I would guess, of the people that said that they have it, I would guess many of you, since you're here in this workshop, fall into this category. Um, so chromesthesia is seeing music in colors. So when you hear uh, music, then you automatically experience colors in that music. And so a lot of people that have this directly use this to uh, fuel what they create visually from their music. And so this is in the creative category because you're using uh, that synesthetic interpretation to try and capture what you see in your mind. And I should clarify um, because uh, for those of you guys that are not familiar with synesthesia, synesthesia is not the same as having an imagination. Uh, it's actually an automatic uh, response. So it's not something that you think about it and then it happens. It's different from imagination. Uh, so synesthesia is, uh, it happens unintentionally as it, a, um, something that you experience and you're not forcing to experience. Um, so yeah, so seeing music in color. So a lot of people that experience this will try and translate this into their work. And it's tricky because whether you have synesthesia or not, a lot of times, I'm sure everyone can relate to this, you see something in your head and you want to try and express that as accurately as possible, but sometimes you're limited by your abilities of knowing the software or you know, if you're trying to draw something that you see in your head, then um, visualize, I know it's going well. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, yeah. Um, I was reading comments or comment from Rob, when I get synesthetic effects from music or visuals, I know it's going well, definitely. Yeah, and that's um, kind of what, what we're leading into is how to think about sound in a way that you can tie the visuals in with it where it really enhances the experience of the sound itself. So good music and good sound, obviously it evokes enough on its own that, that it's a good experience. And um, you know, a lot of people, if you do have a very um, good imagination or synesthesia, when you, when you hear music or sound or certain sounds, then it evokes that automatically. Um, but marrying that with visuals that are intentionally created to uh, coincide with that sound and enhance the effects that you get from listening to that music, then that's kind of what we're, we're leading into is how to think about sound and characteristics of sound that you can uh, create those visuals that will enhance that experience. Um, so this is just a really quick example, uh, motion and hearing synesthesia. Some people have this. So, <laughs> so you might be watching this and, uh, hear in your head, like I can hear right now, uh, certain sounds when you're watching this, it, it's probably, you can actually hear it. Uh, not everybody does, but, um, it, that's a type of synesthesia where motion is translated into, um, hearing sounds that coincide with it. Um, so this is an example. Um, some of you guys might have seen this. Um, this is a collaboration that I worked on, and this goes in the creative category because this was my um, synesthetic interpretation of basically translating how I experience the sounds into um, a visual language. And then with this one, I went frame by frame. Um, so this one, this wasn't like auto-generated touch design. This was frame by frame. Um, placing um, the shapes basically where I saw them in my head. And so uh, certain sounds have more weight than others and certain sounds uh, in my mind appear in a certain position, whether it's the top right or the bottom left, depending on um, you know, their, their pitch and their characteristics. So um, I'll play this really quick. This is just an excerpt from it. The whole thing is only like a minute and 50 seconds, but um, this was a beatboxer reaps one. And uh, so he did the, the beatboxing for it and then he sent it to me to uh, interpret synesthetically and this is what I came up with.
Oh, it cut off those scores again. Um, so yeah, with that one, uh, like I said, I literally, um, sometimes you need to get specific nuance with, with the sound. And we're gonna be talking about all these different ways of analyzing it and having things go with it. But when I listened to this one, I really wanted to capture the exact nuance of the, the size of the shapes and, and their characteristics and personality. Because um, as I mentioned, I, I see sounds as, as physical objects and personalities and behaviors. And so I really wanted to make sure that I captured the exact uh, personality of those in the sounds. And so hopefully when you saw that, um, then you, you agreed or felt that certain things uh, as they moved across the screen embodied certain shapes or in certain sounds uh, as they moved across the screen and fell in different places. Um, interesting thing that I love mentioning about this uh, to coincide with, uh, as Rob was mentioning, you know, you know that you got it right if it's uh, you experience that, that synesthesia from it. And so one of the things that was really funny about working on this is because of that connection between the position and the weight and the sounds is that um, you know, I'd have to place them manually and then go through and play it and then make sure I got the frame right. And sometimes if I got the frame off and then a, a shape was actually in the wrong spot, I would perceive it auditorily as like a sour sound. So like if I moved the square to the bottom and it should have been on the top, then I actually perceived it as like a sour note because it was perceived as being off. And so it was just really um, weird going through that process. And it was distinctly, at least for me, off because visually it should have been one place, but it affected, visually it affected the perception of the sound because the visual was always bleeding over into the uh, auditory experience. And, sorry. Um, and I think, oh, perfect, it is right at nine o'clock, right. So that is our, our first hour. Um, so we're gonna take a break there. That's kind of the uh, inspirational looking at a plethora of different ways to approach visualizing sound. So we're gonna take a break now for I guess about 10 minutes and then we're going to jump into Touch Designer. <laughs> 